Let us pray. Our God who reigns as King sovereignly above, and yet our God who comes as kind Savior below, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In reverence, we come to gather at your table this night to receive your body and your blood, that which was broken and spilled out for us. We do not deserve this gift. We cannot merit it or earn it. You freely give it to us in your grace and your mercy at the expense of your very own dear Son. He who created and sustains all that is became like us that he might, in fact, save us, deliver us from death, free us from our sin, and give us a gift of life eternal in your home, in your kingdom forevermore. Bless us as we study your word. Guide us in all that we do to truly be your people now and always. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We continue our study in Hebrews tonight, looking at the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 15. This spells out the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied, the new covenant that Christ was going to make. And it compares the old covenant with the new covenant and points us to the blood that we share, the meal that we have this night. Reading from Hebrews chapter 9. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was the golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the table of the ta tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot speak now in detail. Now, when these things have been, had been, have been so prepared, the priests are currently continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations of the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkling those who had been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of internal inheritance. The writer to Hebrews compares and contrasts the two covenants what we would call the Old Covenant, that which was given to Moses, to Aaron on Mount Sinai, that which had the Ten Commandments, and that which gave the pattern for the tabernacle, their, the, the place of worship throughout their wilderness wanderings. And the writer compares that earthly tabernacle with what Jesus did in what he refers to as the heavenly tabernacle. The tabernacle became the pattern of design for the temple that they built in Jerusalem. It had a large courtyard. It had an altar at the beginning where they'd offer their sacrifices. It had a, a laver where they'd wash. 
It had the holy place where there were lamps burning 24-7 and a table of presents of bread to remind them that God gave them the man in the wilderness. It also had an altar of incense. But behind that second veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant. There was the mercy seat of God. And only once a year, only once a year, taking the blood of the sacrificial animals, the high priest would enter there to put the blood upon the mercy seat of God, seeking that which would bring forgiveness for his people, forgiveness for their sins, the sins that they had committed. But as the writer points out, uh, those gifts yearly given were insignificant and ineffective. Well, the earthly tabernacle was just that, earthly. It was not permanent. It was a place to worship in the Old Testament. It was a place to help the people come to know God, where they could offer the required sacrifices. But it had no permanence. It had a limited effectiveness. It could never clear one's conscience from the sin which they committed. But then Christ comes. Christ comes as that perfect covenant, that perfect sacrifice. He is the one. He doesn't enter into the earthly tabernacles. It's Matthew who records that incredible verse, that when Christ died, that veil between the holy and holy of places was ripped in two from top to bottom. The access which the children of Israel never had up until the crucifixion of Christ was made available for the first time for everyone to see. Oh, what, a, what an amazing event it must have been for the priest to walk in and be horrified to see that veil ripped in two. Not a simple piece of cloth, but a composite of various materials that would not be easily torn, only could be torn by the divine hand of God. Ripped in two. The priest would enter that veil with the blood of bulls and goats, but Christ would enter that, ta that holy of holies with his. He wouldn't enter the earthly, he'd enter the heavenly. He'd go to that place which was perfect. He'd go to that place which was permanent. He, as the perfect sacrifice, would go to the place that would never lose its significance, that would always hold security for us. He would go there to give of himself, to give his very blood for our forgiveness. What a joy. What a privilege. It was this heavenly sanctuary where the perfect sacrifice could be offered, where it had the permanent solution, and where it had the power to change our lives. The blood of bulls and goats might give them a sense of their cleansing for a short time, but it's the blood of Christ that gives us a sense of our cleansing for all time. For all, for eternity, Christ has offered that perfect gift. His sacrifice is more than just that blood spilled on earth. It's that blood that was shed in heaven, placed on the mercy seat of God that by his grace we would know it, it's that which transforms us from sinners into saints. It's that by which we glorify him. And it's that blood that we share this night. Once again, receiving this most precious gift that Christ gives to us, that we might know the forgiveness he's offered us, the relationship he's made for us, that we might have that assurance. No. We don't have to offer sacrifices anymore. We have the sacrifice, the perfect one offered, that's permanent and powerful and changes all things. Yeah. They used and spilled a lot of blood in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. But now, the final blood has been spilled. And we receive that blood in the gift of the sacrament of the altar to change us, to transform us, that we might be more like Christ each and every time we come to this altar because we'll have a little bit more of Christ in us every time we come to this altar. So tonight, tonight we celebrate. 
We rejoice and reverence that gift that he's given us as we come, come once again, remembering the events long ago. I wanted us to have a full picture of the meal tonight, and that's why I, the scriptures were a little different, and that's why I did incorporate the water. So that as you come tonight to the altar, you can remember not only the fact that it's Christ's blood that we receive, but it's Christ who became the servant of us all. He's the one who washes our feet. He's the one who washes our conscience. He's the one who forgives our sins. He is the master who bows down, gives his life, and serves us out of his great love. So let us reciprocate with a great love for him, remembering everything he did on this wondrous night, rejoicing in it, and being faithful obedient children, now and always, in his kingdom, waiting for his return. Amen.